Before I present this, the steps to determining the 3D geometry, I would like you to think about the rules you learned in high school and predict the central atom in the entity N O F. If you pick the most electronegative atom, fluorine, you are incorrect. In this course, you will learn that the atom that forms the most bonds, nitrogen, is the central atom. After we go through the steps for predicting structures, we will apply them to these entities. Here are the steps to determining the 3D structure. The first step is to calculate the total number of balanced electrons, including charge. The second step is that the atom with the capability to form the most bonds is the central atom. In larger entities, there may be more than one central atom. If the atoms are in the same group, select the lower atom. We saw this earlier with the SO3 example. Both sulfur and oxygen are in the same group, and sulfur was selected as the central atom. When working with oxoanions, the non-oxygen atom is the central atom. Once we've identified the central atoms, we want to connect all the terminal atoms to the central atoms with a single bond. The third step is to distribute the remaining electrons in pairs to give all terminal atoms sufficient electrons to fill their valence shell. And finally, we wish to distribute the remaining electrons in pairs around the central atom. Step five is to determine the formal charges for all the atoms. If they are non-zero, form multiple bonds to minimize the formal charges. And this is repeated until the formal charges are minimized. Observe that nowhere is the word octet. In step five, there is a caveat that only carbon, oxygen, and fluorine require eight electrons, but all other elements are stable with more or less than eight electrons. In step six, if two or more structures in step five are equal, the true structure is the average resonance. Steps one to six are the Lewis model. Step seven is the Vesper model, project into 3D. Vesper is a small but critical addition to the Lewis model. And now we are going to apply this procedure to three different entities. Now to apply these roles to H2O. The first step is to calculate the total number of valence electrons. Oxygen has six valence electrons. Hydrogen has one each. So there are eight electrons. The atom with the capability of forming the most bonds is the central atom. Hydrogen can form one bond. Oxygen can form two. So oxygen is the central atom. And we need to connect all terminal atoms to the central atom with a single bond bond to hydrogen, bond to hydrogen. Forming those bonds uses up four electrons. So we now have four electrons remaining. We now want to distribute the remaining electrons in pairs to give the terminal atoms sufficient electrons to fill their valence shell. Hydrogen in the n equals 1 shell only requires two electrons. It has the two electrons from the bond. So the terminal hydrogen atoms have a filled valence shell with this bonding pair of electrons. The next step is to determine, distribute the remaining electrons around the central atom. So if I put the remaining electrons around the central atom like that, I now have used up all of my electrons. Now to calculate the formal charge. Formal charge on hydrogen is one 
minus zero minus one, which is equal to zero. And on oxygen, it is six minus four non-bonding electrons minus two bonds, which is also equal to zero. So the formal charge on all of the entities is zero. So now the final step, since we've got all the formal charges down to zero, is to project into 3D. The central oxygen atom has four electron domains around it. One, two, three, four. So the parent geometry around oxygen is tetrahedral. And the molecular geometry, given that two of the electron domains are bonding and two are non-bonding, is angular. So oxygen has a tetrahedral parent geometry. So to draw this molecule, we have oxygen attached to the two hydrogens. And this representation shows you that there is an angle between the hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, and then the non-bonding electrons would exist in that location right there to push the two hydrogens down into that angular geometry. The next molecule we wanted to look at was H2CO. Carbon has four valence electrons. Oxygen has six, that's 10. There is a total of 12 valence electrons. The atom that forms the, with the capability to form the most bonds is the central atom. Oxygen typically forms two bonds. Carbon typically forms four. So carbon is the central atom and we want to join the terminal atoms to the central atom with a single bond. In doing so, we've used up six electrons and there are six electrons remaining. Now we need to distribute the remaining electrons to the terminal atoms to fill their valence shells. We already discussed hydrogen as only requiring two valence electrons and in this ar arrangement having a filled valence shell. Oxygen currently has two electrons, so it, to fill its valence shell of eight electrons, we put six electrons around there, and that reuses up all of the electrons. Next step is to calculate the formal charge. Hydrogen, the formal charge we've already seen is zero. Carbon, the formal charge is calculated as four valence electrons, zero non-bonding electrons, three bonds equals plus one, and the oxygen, which we have also seen before, is six minus six minus one equals negative one. Carbon only has six electrons around it, so it is possible to take two electrons from the oxygen and form a bond. Doing so results in the structure as shown. The formal charges on hydrogen hasn't changed because we haven't actually formed bonds or broken bonds from hydrogen. Uh, on carbon, the formal charge has changed to four minus zero minus four, which is zero. And on oxygen, to also be zero. So now all the formal charges are zero. To project this into 3D, we need to look at the central carbon atom and figure out how many electron domains are around the central carbon atom. There are three. One, two, and three. 
this one electron domain has four electrons in it and the other electron domains have two electron domains in it. Something that has three electron domains is trigonal planar. And since all electron domains are bonding, that is also the molecular geometry. And so we want to get a trigonal planar geometry with bonds at approximately 120 degrees. So best that I can do is to project it like that. We're estimating or approximating the bond angle of 120 degrees around the central carbon atom. And that is the final structure of the molecule formaldehyde. The last structure we were asked to look at was ClO2 minus. Now this entity is an anion, has a negative charge, so it is impossible for the sum of the formal charges to equal zero because the sum of the formal charges must add up to the charge on the entity. First step is to determine the number of valence electrons. Chlorine has seven, oxygens have six, 12, 12 plus seven is seven, 12 plus seven is 19, and the charge makes it 20 valence electrons. For this molecule, it's an oxoanion, okay? Oxygen bonded to an atom. And, and so the central atom here will be the non-oxygen atom, which is chlorine, despite the fact that normally chlorine forms fewer bonds. Oxoanions are an exception. And we need to join the terminal atoms to the central atom with single bonds. That leaves 16 electrons. Now we can distribute the remaining electrons in pairs to fill the valence shells of the terminal atoms. Oxygen has two, wants eight to fill its valence shell, so give each oxygen atom six electrons more. That's used up 12 electrons, and so I have four electrons remaining, and I distribute those four electrons around the central atom. Now we need to determine the formal charges. The formal charge on oxygen is minus one. The formal charge on chlorine is seven minus four minus two, which is equal to plus one. So those are the formal charges. Because I have plus and minus beside each other, I can actually form a bond. Oxygen can have a, ma can have a maximum of eight electrons, but chlorine can have more. It is in the n equals three shell. Now the question arises, where do I form the double bond? Do I form the double bond from the oxygen on the left, or do I form the double bond from the oxygen on the right? And Ultimately, the question is, does it matter? I'm going to form the double bond from the one on the left. And that results in the structure as shown. However, I could have formed the bond from the oxygen on the right. And that would have given the structure as shown. There is actually a third option here as well, and that is to form double bond to both of the oxygen atoms. This is possible because chlorine is as electronegative as the oxygens. I'm not going to calculate the formal charges formally, but if I look at this one now, the oxygen on the left has a formal charge of zero, the chlorine in the middle has a formal charge of zero, and the oxygen on the right is minus one. This is reversed for the second one. 
And down here, the two oxygens have a formal charge of zero, and that negative one charge is distributed to the central chlorine atom. Since there are three structures that match the criteria we have of minimizing formal charge and distributing the negative the charges according to the atom's electronegativity, the true structure is actually the average of all of these three. So before we draw the structure, we need to figure out what the average bond order is. So looking at So looking at any one of the bonds to oxygen, okay, just looking at the left one for an example, we want to figure out what the average is. The average is calculated as the sum of the number of bonds over the total number of structures. And there happens to be five bonds, a double, a single, and a double, so two, three, four, five, over three structures. And five over three gives a bond order of 1.33. In order to calculate the average charge, we do the exact same thing we look at the number of charges over the number of structures. In this example, it doesn't matter which oxygen we look at, but to confirm we should do it for them all, there is a charge of zero, a charge of one, or negative one, and a charge of zero. So here we have a negative one charge over three structures. Which gives an average charge of negative one third. And finally, to look at the geometry, if you look at the central chlorine atom in every structure it is in, it has four electron domains. There are two non-bonding domains and there are two bonding domains. So given that the parent geometry is tetrahedral and the molecular geometry is angular. All right, so we have a central chlorine atom it forms bonds to two oxygens. Because the bond order is greater than one, it is a dashed line. That dashed line just says it is between one and two. It doesn't tell you exactly what the bond order is. And then on the chlorine atom, we have those two non-bonding pairs of electrons. Note that we can't put non-bonding electrons around the terminal oxygen the number of valence electrons around the terminal oxygen varies and from being six to four depending on the structure we look at that doesn't affect our geometry so that is fine we do need the number of of, of uh, electron domains around the central chlorine and we have that if we now go in and apply the charges it is negative one-third for every atom that is present in this structure. And so this is the complete structure, correct structure of ClO2 minus or the chlorite ion. Sometimes we wish to determine the structure of ionic entities. In these cases, it is often convenient to consider the separate ions and then join the cation and anion with a single bond.